Welcome to this uh, Evangelion gathering. Can I just emphasize that uh, nobody on the platform seems to be able to pronounce a very simple Greek word. It's Evangelion, not Jellion, or trying to make evangelism out of it. More about that in a moment. But welcome to this sort of lunchtime gathering. Just to say, it's just leaving one o'clock. We'll be done by about quarter to two. Uh, we're not going to be that long, so there'll be time to... Uh, visit the, uh, the toilet, so I'll get another drink before the next session starts at two o'clock. So for those who don't uh, know me, my name is Steve, uh, Steve Hurd. Uh, can I just say, if you weren't in Toppy's seminar just before the lunch break, you must listen to it, okay? It was absolutely uh, awe-inspiring. Um, I got lost trying to take notes, so I've given up on that, but I can't wait until it comes out on the website to listen to it again. So can I strongly commend that to you, although I'm sure uh, I've heard Stephen Deb talk on the subject of marriage before, and I'm sure that that was excellent uh, as well. Just the thing about mentioning what Toppy was talking about in terms of his calling, um, obviously the only other time I've sort of been visible during this week was yesterday, um, with, uh, with Graham and Rob and Helen and others as well, uh, being recognized for um, not the R word, okay, but uh, actually, I don't know about Graham, I think it's true for him as well, being busier than probably I've ever been before, but just not being paid for it. That, that, that is the phrase of life that I've just entered into, having handed over, <laughs> yeah, having handed over leadership of the church. Um, I've, I felt God's call again, uh, and that revolves around Evangelion, raising up evangelists and equipping churches for evangelism, which is what uh, we are all about. Now, in a few minutes, about 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna introduce my friend Graham. This is Graham Seed, who's come all the way from Middlesbrough this morning uh, to be with us uh, and I've simply asked Graham to come. I've got to know Graham. Uh, I've known Graham I suppose for many years but more recently uh, Graham's come to serve us uh, so brilliantly in Huddersfield and I've just asked Graham to come and share his story which is an amazing story of the power of the gospel and what God can do in people's lives which is what evangelism is all about. And just to give us some encouragement in terms of those of us who are involved uh, in evangelism at the local level. And also to commend Graham to you, he served us brilliantly. Uh, uh, Graham spoke at our church, the Art Church in Huddersfield on Sunday morning. And then in the evening he preached to a crowd of about seven, 800 with a combined churches event in Huddersfield Town Hall. And both events were brilliant. We saw a good number of people respond to the, uh, respond to the gospel and be saved. So I wanna commend Graham to you and encourage you to think about how you could use him, inviting him to serve you uh, in your local church, your, your local community, wherever you are from. Um, I'm aware that uh, many of you may not have been at the equivalent meeting that we had this time last year, some of you were, and are wondering why uh, this is called Evangelion. So just a, a few words of explanation. Um, I think, and, and also I, I, I was hesitant to do this because some of you have heard this before, but actually I, I think that I do want to do this because our general collective ignorance <laughs> of what this word actually means, I think perhaps is a picture of our collective losing sight of the ball when it comes to evangelism and reaching out to the lost, okay? Not that I think any of us need to be experts in Greek, but this word, it's a Greek word, by the way, okay? Euangelion, it's actually used over 150 times in our New Testaments. Okay, so you probably don't realize that, that when you're reading the gospel, pick any pages in the New Testament, every third page or so, you will have read a translation of the Greek word euangelion. It's usually translated when we read it as gospel, sometimes as good news or joyful tidings. And that is the best understanding of the word, the good news or the joyful tidings tied in. So right at the beginning of Mark's gospel, Mark 1 verse 1, he says, the beginning of the good news. 
there's the word, euangelion, about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel. Euangelion, same Greek work, the gospel of God. Now, you know, the word gospel, it's laden in Christendom with lots of different uh, religious and theological uh, meanings and understandings. Um, I still sometimes believe that there are some people who think that the gospel is just the first four books of the New Testament, the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But back when um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were writing, when they and Paul and the other New Testament authors used the Greek word, the word gospel or euangelion had a, a very unreligious meaning. It wasn't a religious word at all. It was a, if you like, a very secular uh, word. Um, it was a political word. It was used to announce or proclaim, usually, the victories of the king. It was used to say, we've got good news to announce to you. It was almost like a, 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 a political announcement. Um, I've no doubt that a week today, <laughs> we're going to get a lot of political announcements. Whether there's going to be any good news or not in there, I don't know. But it's that sort of context that the word euangelion we should think about was being used back when Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were writing. So for instance, uh, you may have heard in Roman history, I'm a bit of a historian, when Pompey achieved all his victories uh, over and establishing the empire, he would send envoys back after his battles to announce the euangelion the good news of the victory of Rome over their enemies. Um, there's a famous inscription called the Priene Inscription, dates to 9 BC, that talks about the euangelion of the Roman Empire, the euangelion of Caesar. Um, and it would seem, well, more than it would seem, I'm pretty sure that the New Testament writers had all this in mind when they chose this Greek word, the euangelion. Um, it was a clear challenge to the authorities. So, you know, there's all sorts of discussions we could have about separation of church and state, and, you know, we need to do this but not get involved in that. There was no such thought <laughs> back in, you know, the time of Jesus and in the first century AD. So the gospel writers were making a, an announcement, not just about religion. They were saying, Jesus is savior, not Pompey. They were saying to the authorities, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Because Caesar was declared and worshiped, in some cases, as Lord. So Matthew, Mark, and the others were saying, no, Jesus is Lord. This was a clear challenge to the authorities of the day. They were saying that Jesus is God, not Augustus, because by the time the Roman Emperor Augustus came along, the, the, the Caesar had been elevated to Godship. And the New Testament writers were saying, no, Caesar's not God, Jesus is God. The Lord is God. So euangelion, it's the good news, the announcement of Jesus as savior the announcement of Jesus as Lord of all, as King Jesus. And sometimes we can get all sorts of, you know, techniques about how we share our faith and can we do evangelism this way or we don't do it that way, people don't want to know this or you can't do that anymore. Hey, it's about saying Jesus is Lord. It's about saying, I've got some good news for you. I've got some good news to proclaim. And it's not so much about whether people want to hear the good news or not. <laughs> it's good news. It's good news to tell people. It's a proclamation of the good news that all need to hear and many will respond. So Euangelion, it's the name of our Christ Central project which we launched last year. And the reason 
we, or I, I persuaded, sorry, I should say, the members of the team who are here today. We've got Graham from Liverpool, and we've got uh, Will from Sheffield. Uh, we've got Rachel as well from, from Chester, and our administrator and implementer, Eric, who's not here today, uh, without whom nothing would happen, okay? So Eric is the key man. But please, if you want to know more uh, about what we're doing and how we can help you as a local church, speak to one of these guys um, at the end. Uh, partly we called it Euangelion, is to, is to stir a little bit of interest. Because we, I was thinking, if we called it the evangelism group, I'm not sure some of you would have been here. <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've been there, we've, we've done that before, and, it, and, it, and it's not for me. So part of it was to, to pique a little bit of interest, but also to say, hey, let's, let's, let's clear the carpet a little bit of all the stuff some of which is great about techniques and whatever about evangelism, and get back to a proclamation of Jesus is Lord. That there is a God. I, I mean, I think sometimes we've made our evangelism far too complicated. I love it in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, I think it's verse uh, 21, 22, uh, which is a passage where Paul talks about all of us are ambassadors for Christ. Evangelism is not just something done by the evangelist. It's something done by all of us. We are all to do the work of evangelism. And then Paul summarizes what we should be calling people to do. And he uses four words. <laughs> evangelism, four words. Be reconciled to God. Or if you come from where I come from in Yorkshire, it's get this and rate we God. <laughs> All right? Get right with God. And that's our, that's our proclamation. That's our good news. That there's a God who loves you. And it's so important that you get yourself right with him. Be reconciled to God. That's evangelism. Um, now our role, our aims are raising up evangelists and equipping churches for evangelism. And really that came about... About 18 months ago, when I was uh, reading through um, Ephesians in my, in my Bible study, well-known passages came to Ephesians 4. If you've been around New Frontiers for any length of time, you will know that Ephesians 4.11 is, if not the verse, a key verse for New Frontiers, okay, that God gave the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, teachers, and the evangelists. Why did he give them? To equip the saints for works of service. Now, I was reading that about 18 months ago, and I don't know about you, sometimes well-known passages, I tend to sort of read them and think, oh yeah, I know that, and move on. And I felt a check in my spirit, felt the Holy Spirit say to me, no, pause, read it again. So I, I read it again. And as I read that, verse 11, God gave the, the, uh, the prophets, the apostles, the pastors, and the evangelists, I, I heard God say, not an audible voice, but I felt God say to me, so where are they then? So I tend to hear God in very blunt terms, you know, uh, and I felt God saying, where are they then? And I'm thinking, what? And I perceived that God was sort of saying and getting me to think, so where are the evangelists? If God gives evangelists to the church, where are they? Where are they in Christ Central Churches? And I started to, to think about that. And I thought, well, yeah, we believe that God still gives us apostles. Yeah? We could believe that God gives us prophets. Now, arguably, maybe we haven't got enough prophets in Christ Central Churches, but that's someone else's bag, not mine. Um, we are awash with pastors and teachers. <laughs> Praise God, I agree. We're awash with them, okay? But where are the evangelists? And I started to think, and I only needed one hand. In fact, I didn't even need the whole number of fingers on one hand. And I actually asked that question of our newly formed, as it was then, Christ Central UK apostolic team. Where are the evangelists? And... Um, in terms of evangelists who were equipping churches for evangelism. And I was given two names. One of them was mine. 
and the other was Graham's. To which I pointed out to the team that both of us were entering a period of our life which was recognized yesterday, i.e. we're getting, you know, towards the, what we're saying, the twilight, the best years. I don't know what we're saying, Graham. But anyway, I pointed out to the apostolic team that the two, the, the only two names that we could come up with at the time were not spring chickens, let's put it that way. To reinforce the point of where are they? If God gives evangelists to the church, where are they? So we've set out, if you like, to find them and raise them up. Now, I didn't think that this was going to be particularly easy. I can report back to you after 12 months, it isn't. <laughs> because our findings have reinforced what I thought, that we are not awash with evangelists in our churches. Now, what we want to do is to gather evangelists and those involved in evangelism in the local church more and more. And we've been doing that, and it's great. Some of you have joined us for our online forums, uh, sessions like this, and we've got more events like that coming up. So a plea to you, if you have people in your church who you would say have evangelism as part of their passion, their calling, uh, or could have, please let us know. We'd love to get alongside them and develop that and to nurture that. Please be aware that I'm not asking you to identify to me people with the gift of evangelism because I don't believe there is such a thing. Nowhere in the New Testament does it talk about the gift of evangelism. So that Greek word euangelion that is used over 150 times, there's a derivative of it which is euangelistes, which is used just on three occasions in the New Testament. One is it's used of Philip uh, in the book of Acts. Acts uh, Philip is mentioned, he's called Philip the Evangelist. Uh, it's mentioned in 2 Peter 4, where Paul says to Timothy, hey Timothy, do the work of an evangelist, euangelistes, and then it's used again in Ephesians 4, as we've already said. God gives the evangelist but he gives the evangelist as a gift to the church to equip and encourage the church, all of the church, to do the work of evangelism. Okay? So we're looking to build up, raise up, equip um, evangelists. We are also looking to, alongside that, and as part of that, help to equip churches for evangelism. So this time last year at this event, I went round quite informally and did my own little random survey, uh, picking out, uh, I think I got up to about 13, 14 church leaders of Christ Central Churches UK and asked them the question, in the spirit of Ephesians 4.11, can you tell me which evangelist is equipping your church? How many of those 14 do you think were able to give me a name? None. Now, I could have found some others, and maybe one or two churches would have been able to do that. But I think it was indicative that the equipping of the church for evangelism is something that is not happening a great deal. Now, if the biblical mandate or method is that God gives evangelists to equip the church for evangelism, and if we haven't got many evangelists, and evangelists equipping the churches, you would expect it to follow that maybe evangelism is something we're struggling with. And the other thing we found out over the last year, or even before that, is that that would be true. So we did a survey, actually, which we're hoping to repeat soon. We did a survey of Christ Central UK churches just before COVID, asking the question, how many... Uh, people have you seen saved and baptized over the last two years? And the average for Christ, a Christ Central UK church was somewhere between two and three. Now, a number of churches, a couple of churches, I think were into double figures over two years. Uh, some were up to the seven, eight, nines, whatever. All of which means that there were quite a number of churches for whom the answer to that question how many people have been baptized in the last two years? The answer was nil, or one, or two, or something like that. Now, hey, let's praise and rejoice for every soul that is saved. But let's also recognize 
we want to see more. <laughs> we want to see more. And as we'll hear in a minute, the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. And that includes everyone, even my friend Graham. <laughs> when you hear his story in a moment, the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. The problem is not with the message. If there's a problem, we've got to look at the messengers. And I include myself in this. And whether that's us as individuals, I was thinking as we spent time with Jesus this week, which has been absolutely awesome, there's that passage in Acts 4, I think it is, isn't it, where the authorities noted of the first apostles, they noted that they had spent time with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. <laughs> and it was spending time with Jesus, being with Jesus, that made all the difference for them. We spent time with Jesus this week. Will we have the courage? Will we be brave like the first apostles were to step out? Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and be healed. So that's Evangelium. That's what we're trying to do. Raise up evangelists, equip churches for evangelism. As part of that equipping churches for evangelism, we've got a project within that, which we are in partnership with a Christian charity called Share Jesus International, whereby we are working as a team closely with local churches for a two-year period or probably more of that to serve that church to equip them for evangelism and at Easter this year we started that process with um, Blackpool where's Blackpool there we are we've got a few guys there from Blackpool and also with uh, City Church Lancaster as well so there are they are our first what we're calling Emmaus project the Emmaus project is, is a Share Jesus International project they're giving us loads of wonderful resources to equip churches for evangelism and we're providing the evangelistic motivation and training. Um, as I say, we've got two churches have already started in the autumn. Uh, we're looking and there's a process of application and discussion with leaders and elders. Um, we're looking to extend that to perhaps another two or three churches. So if you're, that's something that you're interested in, grab me afterwards or Will or Graham as well. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to invite Graham. Let's welcome Graham. I'm just going to ask Graham to share his story and bring a word of encouragement for us. Yeah, that'll do there, yeah. You all right there? Are you going to use that? No, I won't no, need that. So, guys, hello. 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 Can you understand my accent? Yeah. <laughs> I, I whispered to Phil and Sally whether they wanted to share my story. Because they're... they're Phil and Sally, my pastors from yeah, 1999, really, and maybe before, and I love them dearly. They're part of my life and always will be. But I, if you ever imagine someone the furthest away from ever wanting to know about Jesus, ever wanting to go to church, I was him. I was the person that would never dream of going into a church. The only time I ever went to church was when my nana went to the Church of the Ascension in Berwick Hills where I was born, where I was living, um, to make sure she was all right. And I was only nine and 10, but I wanted to know she was okay. My nana was a drinker and took a lot of prescribed medication. She often tried to kill herself and she was in a mental institution. But she was the person I probably cared about the most on the planet. And um, so church to me was irrelevant. It was no, no such thing as Jesus. And even though my nana sang about Jesus, but I was, I want you to picture the furthest thing ever away from Jesus. I wasn't like the Apostle Paul, because we know he makes Saddam Hussein look like a choir boy. He used a nasty piece of work. Well, so was I. In fact, the only reason Nicky Gumbel used my story uh, is because my mother told Paul Cowley that she referred to me as the son of Satan. And um, so he, he picked up on that and he uses it uh, all the time on, on that Alpha video. But I went through my life, I was in gang warfare. At 10 year old, my mum left me, I had no dad. And so I ended up uh, searching to belong somewhere. And I searched in the wrong areas. I was born on a council estate. I lived on a council estate. And at 10 year old, 
Uh, my mum left me. I was involved with all kinds of stuff. Um, before I knew it, I was in prison. I used to think it was awesome to have a relationship with the police. They called me by my name, which is great when you walk through Middlesbrough Town Centre, especially if there's a few girls around. And the police saying, where are you going, Graham? I'm like shaking my head a bit, thinking, this is great news. But it's absolutely, it's like in Isaiah 5 says, woe to those who see evil as good, and good as evil. So that was me. I thought evil was awesome. Being bad was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I went to jail, got out of a prison in, when I was 16. My granddad died, I wasn't that bothered. And uh, but my nana had gone to live with my mother. Now my mother and me got married to this man called Dave, who was my stepdad. And I chased him out of Middlesbrough. They had to leave Middlesbrough because of my behaviour, uh, because I'd hit him and robbed him and things like that. And I didn't care. I became very selfish and hard-hearted. And to be honest with you, when I looked in the mirror, I really hated me. I didn't love me. I became the thing that everyone said I was going to become. Where than your dad. My mum said the only difference with you, he hit women, which he used to do with my mother and rape her. And the thing, the difference was, is he used to hit women and I hit men. That's the only difference, she said. But nevertheless, I joined the football firm. I got involved with football violence and... I rang with Middlesbrough Frontline for quite a while, even though I spent most of that time in prison, so I didn't go to many matches. And uh, but I was a hardened football uh, hooligan. In fact, when I met my wife's mum, Natasha, before we got married, and she said to me, "What did you used to do?" And I told her my story for two hours, because uh, that's what time we finished in the day quarter four. Now. <laughs> so she said, "My wife, Natasha, she's from Essex." Went. You used to be a hooligan, didn't you, darling? And it, it really, like, it really brought the air. But, um, but nevertheless, but I used to be involved with all that crime. And in, 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 when I was involved with that, I've had my finger chopped off. I've been hit with a sword over my head and stabbed in the arm and chest, four arms. I've had my right eye cut open. I've had part of my chin took away. Um, I've had all kinds of things. I had my arm ripped open at Leeds. Uh, my muscle was coming through my arm in the cells and got little delves in my skull. I've got no front teeth. And uh, all of these things, that, all these injuries and all of the prison, I just thought that was life. That was part of what I was part of. And I grew up with it. It was second nature, this lifestyle. And in 1989, I found myself in Durham Prison again. And when I got to Durham Prison in 1990, my plan, Graham's plan, which never ever worked, I was, should have known then, but Graham's plan was to move from Middlesbrough. Now, there's nothing wrong with Middlesbrough, by the way. Um, there isn't, is there? And, and, and like the football team, as you know, uh, really the best team in the land. And uh, if you say any different, I'm just a big fat northerner outside, as John, <laughs> as John Archer says. <laughs> I got that one off John Archer, by the way. I've used it all over the place. Uh, but he, got, he tried to get his good looks off me, so we square. But anyway... Um, so I was in jail in 1989, got out in 1990, September, with my plan was to live in Wakefield. Do you know Wakefield? So I went to live in Wakefield, I got a job in Lupset, I worked in Empire Store's catalogue firm, and uh, I, my job, I was a ginormous man, good looking, uh, I've always been good looking, I can't help that, but listen, <laughs> I know you're looking up there, think what a great cast, but I'm married, so sorry. Um, but I remember... My job was cutting up boxes. The boxes had come back and cut them up. And I was doing okay for three weeks. I hadn't had a drink. I hadn't hit anyone. I hadn't robbed anyone. I was doing good. And uh, our thoughts are really crazy because this one morning, I woke, like I was on this, this conveyor belt cutting these boxes up thinking, what on earth am I doing here? What an idiot. What a doyle. I used to make more than 100 quid in 10 minutes in Middlesbrough. What am I doing with myself? So I started robbing the factory, M.I. Stores Catalog Firm. And if you joined M.I. Stores Catalog Firm uh, that Christmas 1990, you got a free years in there watch set. And, uh, and I knew where the cupboard was. It was massive. And I used to take a bag full every night. And I'd sell them in the pubs for a tenner a set. And um, they reckon everyone in Wakefield that Christmas of 1990... Got a his and their watch set for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So if you see Phil and Sally at the back, there's some. I brought some with me, the 15 quid a set now though, inflation. But I got the sack, but you know the thing is about my mind, I, I blame them. I blame the company because I thought they knew I was a criminal. But this is how deceived I was, but anyway, I, I ended up wondering what I was going to do. I got a job on the door of a, of a nightclub called Rooftop Garden, Gardens and worked in a pub called the Woolpack at the top of on Woolpack Court, the top of Westgate. And then before I knew it, I'm uh, hitting an undercover policeman. I ended up in jail again. But this time when I went to jail, it wasn't like before. See, there's three things you do when you go to jail. Well, that's what I did. Was find out who worked in the kitchen. I like my food, I know you can't tell. And, uh, and, uh, and work, find out who works on the servery in the prison. And the third one is very important to find out who the gym orderly is. They go hand in hand and I wasn't caring about anything else other than eating and going to the gym. And so um, this time I went to prison, I went to Armley Jail in Leeds, which is now HMP Leeds. And I was depressed. They reckon I had a psychotic break in Woods and I was just shut down and my, my head was in bits. I was thinking about all the things I'd done wrong. And um, anyway, when I got out, in, in, uh, in the, out of that jail in November 1992, I went back to Middlesbrough. Because that was the only thing I could think of that would make me happy again. And I went back to Middlesbrough and I drank a bit and did a few robberies and had a few fights and met a few girls. But it wasn't the same. I didn't have the same feeling as when I was a kid. I just thought it was rubbish. I hated it. My nana had died by then. And um, one night in, in uh, February 1993, I walked around this corner in uh, Middlesbrough Town Centre called, and the, it's where Grange Road is, it goes right the way through the town. There's a really rough street where the prostitutes stood and all the pimps. And there was a bench there and I could hear this music and I went there and there was all these people there, I knew most of them. And I said, what are you doing? And I remember it was February. They said, oh, we're still celebrating Christmas. So uh, they were all drinking and smoking weed and some was taking heroin. So I joined in the party, and when everyone went, I was sat on this bench, and I thought, right, this is, gonna, this is where I'm going to live from now on. I'm going to live and die on this bench, because I don't want to live inside, I don't want to be anywhere else, I want to be free. And for the next three years, I lived on that bench. And uh, for the first year, I drank and drank unconscious. I woke up with bust faces. Uh, I was, I'd been beat up many times by old enemies. I'd been hit with stuff. One time I had a load of horsemen you would pour out on me. I had all kinds of things going wrong. Sometimes I'd wake up with no shoes on. And, um, but I, I was in a right state. I was injecting heroin, I was smoking crack cocaine. I even snorted paracetamol. Now the paracetamol didn't daunt me, I just didn't get a headache. And <laughs> I'll leave the pauses. But, uh, <laughs> but I remember in March 1996, um, this story is about to get really good now, but this is the good news. And uh, this man called Patrick Hinton had been on holiday in, in 1995, and he read a book called Tough Love by John Macy. And John Macy at the time was a Teen Sons director, UK. And he was telling a story about a lad called Jay Fallon. And they were telling this story in this book called Tough Love. And Patrick read it and thought, hmm. I'm going, to, I'm going to set up Teen Challenge Teesside. And that's what he did for the next whatever long it was. In March 1996, Teen Challenge Teesside went on the streets of Middlesbrough. I was the first person that they spoke to. They came up and they told me, this man called Brian Wade from Wigan said, do you know Jesus loves you? I used to be an alcoholic. I said, so what? I still am. And there's no such thing as love, and there's no such thing as Jesus. A week later, this lad called Aidan, sat next to me, Aidan Poulter, and he said to me, um, you know, Brian was telling you, he's, tell he, he's, he's free from alcohol and all that, he, Jesus loves you. And I said to him, listen, there's no such word as love. Love's a man-made ma manipulation tool. If you tell someone you love them, you can have whatever you want, do whatever you want. And as for Jesus, it's nonsense. So that year, I went into a coma. It was 9th of August, 1996, I went into a coma. And um, I, was, I had several major things wrong with me. 
and on the 15th of August 1996, my mother, who disowned me when I was 22, said she was called to the hospital and was told that I was, I was dead. She needed to come and stand the farms to turn the machine off. She went to the hospital with my stepdad. By this time, my friend Lee Harrison had played um, songs in a nightclub for me to say goodbye to me. People had come to say goodbye. My best friend, Tony, was there. And then these lads, Pete, Aidan and Nicky, came to the hospital and said to my mum, can we pray for him? And my mum said, what good will it do? Because I've got the farms here, he's dead. He, 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 there's no, nothing can save him. The consultant, Dr. Cole Smith, said he's dead. But anyway, they managed to talk my mum into letting me, them pray for me. They came into the intensive care room where I was on my own. I had a ventilator down my throat and tubes coming up with all over me. I had had eight blood transfusions and I was getting pumped with antibiotics and pure protein. And I was 11 and a half stone. I'm just a bit fatter than that now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these lads prayed for me and I said to them, what, what did you say? And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, give this man new life. And I woke up. I pulled the mask, the ventilator out my throat because I was choking. My mum got the consultant. He told my mum, when she said I thought he was dead, he said, well, he's made a remarkable recovery. <laughs> 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 he had no other answers. So anyway, the next day, I asked my mum. She tells me about that, and she, I said to my mum, what does Jesus want to know about a scumbag like me for? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> I, I ask them when they come. So that day, Pete, Nicky, and Patrick, and a few others came to the hospital. And um, one of the things I do when I'm doing evangelist training is be very careful of your, of your Christian jargon. Because these lads come, and I think they've had loads of vodka <laughs> and loads of acid, because they start telling me about a man dying on a cross for me, his blood spilled for me, and I'm thinking, eh, the poor lads. <laughs> but I'm being respectful because they're at the hospital, and I invite them every day because they bring nice sandwiches and sweets and drinks and stuff. <laughs> so I'm not going to pass that up, you know what I mean? But to be totally fair, um, you, you were sat here now, and when you're on your own, you know what you were thinking. And, you know, you, no one can know that, only God. And at that moment when I woke up, I knew that I knew that I would never drink again, take drugs or smoke. I knew it. I didn't know about the violence. That's my biggest problem. Anyone who knows me, like Phil and Sally do, and uh, is my mouth. I've still got a bit of a... It's not as bad now, but I, I've pulled people out of shops and stopped bands. And I, I, even as, as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple... I've had some of the leaders cry in the church because I was I was mouth not violent with my hands anymore, but I had a mouth on me. And in the early days, I couldn't stop it. Um, but I gave my life to Jesus on an alpha course. And the interesting thing is, which is, I asked my mum on that day, "What did Jesus want to know about a scumbag like me for?" The first talk I heard of Martin Ruddock at the alpha course was. Why did Jesus die? And that night I couldn't believe that Jesus Christ, if he was real, he died for love. He died for Graham. And on November the 9th, 1996, at quarter to three, I gave my life to Jesus. At 10 o'clock that night, November the 9th, 1996, at 10 o'clock, I began my ministry. On the 10th of November, 1996, I went to church for the very first time as a disciple. I went to the Oakwood Centre, Emmanuel Fellowship, and I went there and seen these men on the platform. And, you know, if you, if you ever listen to uh, Dave Parson, he says he, 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 I don't know whether he ended up writing it before he died, but he said um, he's going to write a book on the dangers of answered prayer, never mind not answered prayer. And I remember thinking, I said, I want to be on that platform. I only just walked in the church, but that was all I was. I've always been someone who wants to be, give everything I've got, everything. And um, my friends told my wife that they have no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, if Graham's really into Jesus, then he'll, he'll go all the way. 
what my friends didn't realise at that time, I couldn't have done that on my own. And people who you were going to meet like me can't do it on you can't do it on your own. You need Jesus. I've got five more minutes. So you need Jesus, and Jesus is the only one. The good news. Now listen, that I've I've had everything. I bought my first house with cash. It was good news. I've had women, good news. I've had cars, it seems like good news. But the greatest news I ever had in my whole life was on November the 9th, 1996, a quarter to three, when Jesus Christ came into my life by the Holy Spirit. And I know that there's nobody, it's never impossible to be away from Jesus. Now, I get asked all the time and said all the time, yeah, but I haven't got a story like that. Well, neither did Patrick. And you know, Jesus was never an addict. Jesus Christ wasn't a drug addict, an alcoholic, or he didn't go fighting at the matches. But Jesus knows exactly what we need and can help us where we're at, it doesn't matter who you are. And the Apostle Paul, who I mentioned in Acts 9, if you've read that story, which I'm sure you have, if you study it and keep looking at it and, and watch and read Philippians 3, 12 to 14, you'll understand that people who want to set up ministry, you're looking to something. And in Philippians uh, 3, 12 to 14, it says, looking heavenwards. But I know a lot of people look towards the ministry rather than looking heavenwards towards the ministry. And do you know, I started to learn something very quickly that I can't do it. In fact, the greatest news I ever got was December 1996, laid in my bed in a, in a house that I wasn't, be, I wasn't meant to be in, but I lived there for the first two months. And the council let me live there because they thought, I'm not doing any harm. And they let me live in this back bedroom of a house for two months before they gave me a rented flat. And I was laid on my bed one night before I went to Teen Challenge bus. And I really believe it was the first time I'd ever really felt Jesus speak to me. And he said this, Graham, do you know there's only one number one? And that's me. You don't have to worry about that ever again. Because I was always striving to be the best. And the people you meet, like me, are more scared of you than you are of them. And when you find a man or woman of peace, they'll protect you. You know, I think they know that, but if anyone, anyone, that have ever done that with these two, they'd have had me to pay for. I'd have sorted them right out, big time, and my mates. Because you fall in love with them who help you. And Patrick Hinton, he became like a dad as well, in the Lord and his wife. And uh, I remember him getting punched twice, and I wasn't there. And Patrick was like, uh, he was like, uh, he owned 50 supermarkets and he went to Cambridge and I said to him, brother, I'm fuming. He went, brother, why? I said, because you've been punched again. I wasn't there. And he went, brother, what would you have done? I said, I'd have ripped their heads off. <laughs> and he went, brother, that's why you weren't there. <laughs> So he was full of wisdom, but Patrick wasn't an addict. Patrick wasn't a drug addict, an alcoholic, I went to matches or... But 75% of what I have is what people are interested in, and is your care. And as we read in Matthew 7, you'll know them by the fruits, longevity. I've been following Jesus, and everyone knows how many... I tell people I've made mistake after mistake after mistake. I'm very transparent. I don't care telling people that I've made mistakes. I'm not holier than now. I make mistakes all the time. But I'm very quick to repent. Every day I pick up my cross and walk with it. And one of the greatest things that I could ever tell you about evangelism is what I learned in 1998 at the School of Ministry of a man called Dr. Brock, who was one of the most beautiful men I've met. And uh, he was teaching the students. And he said, let's look at uh, um, John 11:43, And he talked about uh, the raising of Lazarus. And that was me. I felt I'd been I'd raised from the dead. And 
I want to go and tell everyone, I want to tell the world about Graham and how Jesus brought him out of the coma and how he gets all the glory. And I didn't really have a real understanding of how to do it until this moment. And it was in verse 43 when Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And he comes out of the tomb. And then he says to the disciples, now go and take the strips of linen round his wrists and round his feet and the grave cloth that's on his face. And they went and did it. And I wondered why. And this was the anchor of my life. Jesus said, I do the miracles and you do the work. I call people out, not you. And if you're willing and available to be a mouthpiece for Christ, like it says in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 16 to 20, you'll know not only will he be with you to the end of the age, but he'll give you the authority to be able to do that. So God bless you all. Can he play? Yeah, why, why don't we stand if we can? And just hold our hands out. Father, we thank you, Lord. I thank you so much for your love. I thank you, Lord, that on August the 15th, 1996, that you took me out of death. You give me life. But you just didn't give me that life. You give me a resurrection life, a new life. I am the resurrection and the life. And Lord, today I pray that you would bring a new resurrection life out of the hearts of my brothers and sisters, the leaders in this room, that you would give them a staring, a staring of how mightily we can be used to tell someone that Jesus loved them. That was the seed that began the process of me getting to know you. When Brian Wade said, Jesus loves you, that word didn't come back void. So Lord, allow us to be stirred up, to go to the nations or go to our shop or in our workplace or in our schools or wherever we are, Lord, and just say, do you know Jesus loves you? And then leave it and see what happens. Lord, I want to thank you for the, the way you've taught me and you've helped me. You've educated me. I have no education from the world. My education is from above. I have no GCSEs or A-levels or degrees, or, but I have a, a, a University of Life Master's degree on how to change. So, Lord, help us all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Bless you, mate.